Hello, and welcome to the Modern Maker Workroom, Season 3, Episode 7. In this episode, we'll take our skirt all the way through to the finish. We'll start with making and applying the guard around the hem, followed by padding and gathering the waistline and stitching it to the waistband. I hope you've really enjoyed this uh, skirt series. And coming up next, we're going to have the jacket series quickly following it. Thank you so much. Now warm up your needles, get your hands ready, and let's start stitching. I have drawn four inch wide strips on the bias for this wool. And I'm just going to cut them out. I'm going to give them a little press. I'm going to sew the ends together. And I'll be sewing the straight grains together, so I'll show you that in a minute. But it's very similar to other bias strips that we've done. I'm going to give myself just a little extra chunk because I estimated the amount that's going to go around the hem just in terms of hand spans. And I may or may not need a little extra piece, so I'm just going to use the scrap and have it on hand just in case. Better safe than sorry. So I have a couple of the bias strips that I cut to put on the skirt as the decorative band around the bottom, what they call a guard. And I'm just about to stitch the seam. It's nothing that you haven't seen before in my other videos, but I'm going to do it anyway just in case this is your first time. So this is kind of a crude example of how to put these together, but they're cut the same width and you can see that I line them up so that there is a little cross at each side. And that is because this area right here, this line that goes from intersection to intersection, that's where I want to sew. You see, I'm doing this flat on the surface so that I make sure I get a decently straight line. It helps me uh, sight the line a little bit better. If I wanted to be extra accurate, I could just as easily chalk it. But where's the fun in that? There's no adventure. All right, so my line is basted. And now just right next to that line, I'm going to do a back stitch. I want this to be nice and strong because the, this decorative piece is at the hem of the dress, which means that it's likely to get caught on things if I'm not careful. So I want these seams to be a little bit stronger than other decorative strips. In, in most other cases, I would just use a running stitch. So I'm starting at the left end with this back stitch and I'm making it kind of small and tight. And so from this side, when you work a back stitch, it's, it's very similar to the embroidery stitch that's called a stem stitch. So your direction is left to right, but your needle passes right to left through the fabric. So now that I've got it started, I'm gonna pass my needle through to the other side, and I'm going to work a standard back stitch from this direction. I just always like to start my seams that way so that um, I have more control over the fabric. And I know I say that every single time that I do it on camera, but I feel like it's important to realize that you're you're allowed to modify the way you start and stop and, and handle the fabric so that it works best for you and your body and your needs. It shouldn't compromise your sanity to make a garment that's high quality. All right, now that I'm at the end here, I'm gonna take a couple stitches in one place and then I'm going to do a couple of back stitches the opposite direction to secure it. And then I'm gonna cut my thread trim away my excess seam allowance and then I'm going to show you what it looks like on the outside. This is this is how our seam looks now. It's nice, it's clean, and you'll notice that the edges continue relatively smoothly and that's because we started in that little crook that I was talking about. We are at the iron. I have all of my seams joined in one long strip here. So I'm going to press the seam allowances open. I'm going to press them real well Get under here. I'm going to use this uh, block of wood 
to help smash the seam allowance open and keep it nice and flat. It cools the wool a little bit, which um, in the long run makes it lay better on the fabric. All the seam allowances have been pressed, and now I'm going to press this edge. Now here's the thing to remember. When we stitch this onto the skirt, the skirt has a rounded hem and we're stitching the large part, the larger curvature first. So the seam allowance that we're pressing under here, this hem that we're pressing back, when you think in terms of a comb, this is the shorter edge. So what I'm doing as I press is I'm giving this piece of bias a little bit of a curve Right, so let me find the starting place on the skirt, which is the final join of the facing. There it is. So I have my skirt right side up now, and I'm about to attach the guard to the front. And the way this works is I will align the raw edge of the guard against the top line of basting that I can see at my hem. And I'm just gonna running stitch along the bottom of it and then it will get flipped up and the top edge will be hemmed or pick stitched or whatever I choose, probably pick stitch since that's one of my favorites. Uh, and then I'll do that all the way around. But right now all I care about is just getting this secured. Now with every stitch that I take here, I am also securing the facing on the inside. So I'm gonna keep this seam allowance nice and narrow. We're talking like a quarter of an inch or less. And I'm gonna take my back stitches every four or five stitches so that I can uh, make sure that it's sturdy. So if any of these stitches come undone, then it won't run past one of the back stitches. As I work, I can feel the facing on the back side and I can feel the little bubbles of ease that I put in as we were going around the curve. So with these stitches, I'm using my under hand, uh, the fingers on the underside to just kind of work the fullness into the area where I'm stitching while the thumb keeps the fabric on top steady and organized. In this position, sitting as a tailor in the chair with this big skirt on the lap, one of the more important things to remember is that you need to keep the skirt from dragging on the floor, especially if you're the kind of person that is making these sorts of garments outdoors while you're at like a Renaissance fair or a reenactment. You want to be really mindful of things dragging on the ground because they'll just get filthy. So pile the skirt in your lap on top of your knee and then work on top of your knee. This is a bit of a modified tailor's position. You can see that my, my knees aren't perfectly crossed. I've kind of got my left leg a little bit flat on top. And that's just because, I'll be honest, I put on a little bit too much weight to cross my legs comfortably. So I have to sit uh, in this position. And I will tell you, it's a little bit less comfortable and a little bit less efficient than uh, how I used to sit. If I really wanted to go to a place where my knee was in the right position, I could also make a little footstool and raise my knee up that way without having to cross my legs at all, which honestly is probably more ergonomic and better for your back. I am just a few inches away from the end of this uh, first pass of stitching on the skirt trim. As I reach the join here, I'm just gonna fold this back. Now I'll, I'll handle this a little more carefully once I'm at the actual point, but this is what's going to happen. I'm going to come here, I'm going to overlap, I'm going to stitch a little bit past, I'm going to cut this off and finish. Then I'll flip it up and I'll hem it in place against itself. But for now, I'm just going to fold that out of the way and finish up my, finish up my first line of stitching here. Okay. 
Here I am, I'm about to cross over the seam. So I'm making sure that I manipulate this so that the fold is just right in line with the seam as I come to it. Now the fabrics are getting really thick here. So I'm switching to kind of a spaced back stitch just to enable me to make sure that I catch all of the layers. It's getting thick, it's getting a little complicated. So one of the beauties of hand sewing is that you can change stitches right in the middle of what you're doing in order to accommodate certain uh, factors and features. So here we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm gonna angle this upper layer just a little bit to shorten it slightly so that when I fold it up, I'm not, um, I'm not fighting the extra width that comes from it being the layer that's inside. I'm still following what I can feel underneath of my stitching line. I've got my finger, my left finger is underneath here and I can feel where the other ridge is that's the line of stitching. So now that I'm done here, I'm just going to do some back stitches. These aren't going all the way through, um, just, just enough to secure the piece that I've got here and then I'll cut. Cut that off there. These are definitely the wrong snips to be using for this task here, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So you can see now, I've shortened that up a little bit, but as I fold this up, the edges blend quite nicely together and the the under layer here, which I shortened up slightly, now appears to be perfectly even. And that's why I shortened it, is because if I hadn't shortened it, then it would be sticking way out here, and then I would have to shove and push to get it to go back down. Okay, so now I'm going to turn my work. I've lined up that folded edge. I think I have just enough thread here to stitch this. So I'm going to take three stitches in one place to secure my thread. And then I'm going to, as innocuously as possible, I'm just going to take little fell stitches along the edge to secure this in. You could do this with slip stitches. You can flip it to the, in, turn it to the inside and stitch inside if you want to, but I find that just because it's lined up on a seam, it's just easier to do it with some small, secure fell stitches. Okay, now that this is done, I'm just going to tunnel the thread inside the layers to a different location, and I'm gonna cut it off. I took a few stitches in one place to secure it. Okay. So that's where it needs to be. And our next step is going to be going to the iron so that I can turn this up and give it a little press. One of the best features of working with wool is its ability to shrink and mold into shape. It's, I think, why it's been one of the most popular fabrics for tailoring for so many centuries. So, this has been stitched in place and now I'm turning this band up and I'm going to press it in place. And as I do, I'm going to make sure that, make sure that I'm getting the band to be quite flat at the top. It's pretty essential because I really need it to to shrink in, which is why we put it on the bias. So we stretched in the instructions to put the band on, we pulled this a little bit snug as we went, which stretches that edge out, which will shrink the top edge naturally. Even so, we may still end up with a bubble like this, which we have to work with the steam and the iron to uh, shrink away. And there we go just vanished. And what I'm gonna do now, just because we're in the middle of 
pressing this and I don't want anything to move is I'm gonna actually start my quick basting right now. So that I'm basting as I'm pressing and just kind of saving myself the time of doing the basting in a separate step. I've already got the fabric here. It's already in place. It's already flat. There's no reason why I shouldn't just make sure that it stays secured as I get started. Particularly if you have an unlined skirt, I think making sure that you add a guard around the bottom is very essential to having the right drape on the skirt. These skirts can be made out of fabric that's heavy or a little bit lighter, depending on the season you're planning on wearing it. But the edges really need to be well made and built up so that so that the skirt really has structure. Like it's a tailored garment, just like any other. And you can see the structure manipulation that we're putting into this. And this is, you know, these are techniques that are based on surviving garments. This is all about making a skirt that's a lot more intentional and a lot more, in my opinion, a lot more real. So I'm using a pick stitch with a contrast color thread on this, uh, on the top edge of this band. And I may also top stitch or the pick stitch the lower edge as well so that it looks symmetrical. But the principle is that I really want stitching that's gonna showcase the handwork. I want it to look regular, I want it to be attractive, and uh, I want people to notice that things are sewn by hand so that they'll ask questions. And I think that if we, as a culture, start to talk about things that are made by hand uh, in terms of craftsmanship and skill instead of in terms of witchcraft and magical levels of patience, etc. I think that uh, we can further the conversation of limiting the use of machines and um, supporting the idea that humans are capable of just as much beauty, if not more. So I'm trying to get into a good rhythm here so that I can do this fast. Uh, the motion is much like a back stitch, but I'm not reaching all the way back to connect up to the previous stitch. I'm just making a small pick. All the bastings are out all of them, uh, including everything that I could see underneath here. And now I'm just going to take the iron and I'm going to just press everything one last time. This helps uh, close up the holes from the basting threads. This helps even out everything along the hem. What I love is that I hope as you're following along, you're feeling how substantial this hem is. And just the proper tailoring of the hem is going to give you a pretty remarkable uh, drape when it's actually on the body. And I think that's something, again, that uh, is largely ignored when people make 16th and 17th century skirts. There's just not enough meat in the construction to give it the oomph that it needs to really hang well. Something to keep in mind as you're doing this work, this same kind of construction of the hem of the skirt can be used to construct the hem of a cloak to give it a much better, more attractive drape and hang. We are getting ready to um, gather up the waist and start stitching it onto a waistband. But before we can do that, we need to pad our we need to pad our edge just a little bit. So what I have here, look, this is the scraps left over from uh, putting the guard along the hem. I'm going to keep this 
back. So here's one of the facings at the edge. I'm gonna keep this little piece of wool a little bit back from there. So I've got about a quarter of an inch between the facing and where I'm gonna stitch this. And then I'm gonna base this along here. I'm gonna leave it free at the bottom because in all honesty, once we stitch this, we kind of want this to flop around a little bit. Uh, the, eventually the folds will not nest properly together and it'll kind of give a little bit of extra boof to the top of the uh, skirt in the gathering area. I have my needle threaded up in white, fine, weak basting thread. And I'm just going to baste along the top here, just real quick. Now, in terms of surviving pieces, there's really not very many that show this extra padding at the top, but I think there's at least one Italian piece um, from the 16th century that has a little bit of padding at the top of it like this. So we're doing this here because we know it will make the gathers look really, really nice. The next, thing the next thing that I'm doing here is I'm preparing the waistband slash ties. Now, um, this particular type of skirt, there aren't any surviving examples of this exact cut of skirt, but it's my presumption based on some dictionary entries from the early 1600s that this type of skirt um, was closed at the front and the back and that the openings were at the side seams. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the waistband have long tails on it so that it can be tied around the body. The waistband is assembled exactly the same way that we assembled the guard that went around the hem of the skirt. The bias is cut and then the selvage edges are put together and sewn with a back stitch. Now we did some of the guard stitching with a running stitch but because this is at the waist it will be subject to a lot more stress and wear and tear. So it's really important that we use a back stitch to sit, sew these seams um, to keep it a little bit stronger. One of the benefits of cutting the waistband and ties with a bias strip of fabric is that the uh, waistband will have a little bit more flexibility in, in it so that it won't break down as easily over time. It'll also be more comfortable to wear. They've been sewn together and pressed uh, in half along the length. I cut them, they were about two inches wide or five centimeters. So um, that way what we'll do is we'll do a narrow seam allowance and then we'll fold and we'll roll so that it's gonna be a relatively narrow binding at the top. We're going to squish the gathers down so that they're nice and sturdy. And then, um, then the tails will hang off at the ends and become the ties with which you close the skirt. What we need to do now <clears throat> is we need to take this strip and we'll fold it in half and make our thumb crease for the center. Uh, and now that I know where it is, I'm gonna mark it with uh, just a little notch, just a tiny clip in the edge, not too deep, just enough to know where the mark is. The mannequin is 28 inches, which is what I'm making the skirt for, so that's uh, 14 and then seven is one quarter of that. So we're looking at, we're looking at about that width for the back. I'm gonna go a little bit wider than that and that way the skirt has plenty of overlap at the sides. So I'm gathering the entire width of the back down into this tiny little area here. So I'm gonna make a little clip notch there and then I am going to make a little clip notch here. Now I have my distances. That's center, that's my notch right there. So this will go here and then all of that gets gathered in. And it's not as dramatic as it seems. It's maybe, you know, uh, it's maybe three times fullness. And with the extra padding in here, that means our gathers are gonna be very beefy and good to look at. So for my next trick, what I'll do is I will 
thread up my needle with my good, strong, heavy thread, and I will run my gathers. I'm gonna do a double strand of the heavy thread, and I'll run my gathers, and I'm gonna run them really close to the basting, so just beyond the quarter of an inch where the basting is, and then they'll get, um, I'll do this half right here. I'll go from here to here, I'll do my gathering, and then I'm going to stitch the gathers in with uh, a fresh thread. And then with that little quarter of it done, then I'm going to run another set of gathers and I'm going to stitch back the other way. And doing it in these small chunks makes it a lot more manageable. And it also means that you're doing it in several pieces of smaller thread so that if any of these stitches break and your gathering starts to come undone, you're not gonna lose your entire skirt. Start the gathering stitches to the inside of the facing. I don't want to gather the facing at all. So I'll start here. I got a nice fat knot in my double strand and that way my my big knot's not going to pull through the fabric. But I'm just going to take a running stitch with this thread and I'm making it a very even running stitch. And what I'm doing is I'm using the thimble to push the needle through and then as it comes through, I'm basically tapping it on my fingernail, like on the flat surface of my fingernail on front and back on uh, my index finger and my thumb. And that lets me know that the tip of the needle has come all the way through and it helps me regulate the length of the stitches. So I'm going to stitch this and I'm going to get halfway across and then I'm going to secure the gathers, measure them against the distance they have to be sewn in, and then I will proceed to stitch the gathers in place. And I do it in a very specific way. If you've watched my menswear uh, free videos, you've probably seen the gathering video. Here I am. Next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do one of the rarest things. I'm going to actually use a pin to place my center. The pin won't last long, but it's just a quick temporary hold. I'm going to use a pin there. And I'm going to find my other side to trim this off. I have a pin here. Okay, with that in place, I'm just going to take this gathering thread and I'm going to pull my stitches I'm just gonna gather it down until it fits that area. And because we have the padding in there, we have to pull quite tight, which is great because it gives us beautiful, thick fullness in a relatively lightweight fabric. Okay, we're very nearly there. Just gonna give it one more extra tug. Perfect. So now what I'll do now that I have everything where I want it, I'm gonna hold this thread in tension, and then I'm gonna take a couple of stitches in one spot to secure my gathering thread. So I've done my gathers, and now I'm locking it in place and cutting it off. And that means that I can now thread up with a fresh one. And this one, I'll just do single strand. this will be the one that I actually stitch with. And this is important because again, if the stitches holding the gathers break, the gathering isn't lost. If, uh, if I were to stitch the gathers in place while using the thread that has pulled them tight, then I lose everything if it comes apart. So now what I'm doing is I'm going in and I am 
lining up my edges. I'm using a back stitch. I'm lining up the cut edges and I'm going through the gathering and I'm making sure that every stitch goes around a couple of gathering folds and out through the previous stitch. It's bulky, it's awkward, and I'm also trying to keep a relatively narrow seam allowance as I do this. And all of this together means that the gathers are not only secure, but they are stitched in a way that uh, kind of, how do I describe it? It crushes it with a specific alignment that makes all of the gathers look really nice. So if you can see this, you can see how clean and tidy those gathers are. And then when it's all done, then I'm going to wrap this binding around the top and then I'm going to stitch it down very tight as well. Altogether, this should make for a really beautiful drape along the back of the skirt. All right, now that I'm past all of the gathers, I'm gonna push my needle through to the other side and I'll finish up my stitching with a standard back stitch. It makes it easier when I, when I switch like this, it makes it much easier for me to control the end of the fabric so that I can get right to the very edge. It's a little bit harder to do from the other side. All right, that's the last stitch. I'm going to do a couple of back stitches along the way. So from here, I will gather up and stitch the other half of the back. So that'll go from, where's my other notch? Then I'll go from this notch here to center. Once that's done, then the binding gets wrapped around very nice and tight. And then I stitch that in place and I'm gonna squish that as I go. And that'll really give this nice secure finish to the waist, but it's a very minimal finish so that it'll, it'll hang nicely on the body. So this is the waistband slash tie for the front. And I need to mark this for the different uh, portions of the skirt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this in half and I'm just going to give a little clip in the band there, get a little clip and that gives me my center. From here, I know that I want the front to equal three quarters of the waist measurement. The back is about half of the waist measurement. And this is so the skirt will overlap a little bit at the sides. So you'll have the back sitting around the body here and then the front will overlap and then tie in the back. And this enables, uh, especially because women uh, have very fluctuating body sizes and you can have a skirt that adjusts for pregnancy. There's a lot of different reasons why this type of skirt construction makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I don't necessarily need to go into the semantics about that right now, but I really love that the concept of adjustability and longevity for changing bodies and maternity, I think it's all part of the way these are built. I just think it's brilliant. So three quarters of the waist measurement is 21 inches. So that, this is folded in half and that's 10 and a half inches right there. So I'm going to put another clip in both layers of this little band so that I know where that is. And then I want to mark the front distance, which is going to be 1 12th of the waist. And I measured the other, it's about two and a half inches on either side. It's about five inches across the front, which is not particularly large, but it definitely, uh, that flat section will make it hang and look really nice. So, so I'll begin, not here, I'll leave everything to the edge. This is, I guess this is about an inch and a half. Um, let me think. Uh, See, inch and a half, that's like three centimeters, 3.2 centimeters, something like that. 
so I leave that area flat at the side and that's just to help a, a clean overlap. And I have a nice big knot here that will help the thread stay secure. So I'm going to run these gathers and I'm going to actually make the stitches fairly long. I, I think I've got these uh, stitches are about, I would say, three eighths of an inch apart or a quarter of an inch. So just, you know, about six millimeters. So nothing gigantic, but you don't want to try to make like super fine gathering threads either, because if you do, the thickness of these layers all working together is going to be really hard to gather in and pull down to the right size. So because we have thicker padded um, gathers at the top because of this extra layer of fabric, you really do need to make your stitches bigger to accommodate it. And that's the beauty of it. You have this fine fabric that is gonna fall in kind of fat folds, which will look really nice hanging from the really narrow waistband. And you should get a beautiful drape off of the waist and over the hip, especially if you're wearing even just a small hip roll. A moderate hip roll will make these folds just lie beautifully. You see that I'm only taking a few stitches at a time. I'm keeping an eye on where my stopping point is, which is right here. In fact, I'm gonna make this clip just a little bit more prominent so that I can see it more clearly. That way I don't have to look, I can just do it by feel. We are right where we need to be with our notch. So let me grab the band and let me find the corresponding notch on the band which is here. I'm just going to quickly stick a pin in here. Now you all know that pins are not something that I use particularly often. So I'm only going to use it in this one instance in order to gather everything down to what it needs to be. And I'm going to match this edge here with my notch that denotes my three quarters of the waist measurement, right? So now I have all of this fabric that I can gather down into this small little space. So I'm gonna leave my needle attached and I'm going to draw this fabric down slowly, methodically, and gently because I don't want to snap my threads I don't want the fabric to twist. So I'll secure the stitch right here and anchor it. And then as I stitch across, I'll use my needle to pull the gathers into position and I'll even them out as I work. So here I go. and. These stitches are going to be taken right on top of the gathers. So now I'm going to drag a gather over into position and I'm going to lasso it up with the needle and a back stitch. And then I'm going to pull tight and then I'll pull another one into position. So my stitches on this side are actually going around to gathers. Once I have two or three stitches done, I can remove this pin because it will do nothing but be in my way. So the next gather comes over. I'm going to push it in place and do a back stitch around it. All of these stitches held in place, nice and solid. And then after I'm done stitching all of this, the folded edge of this band will come around and we have essentially a binding instead of a waistband. And what this will do is it will sit much more at a perpendicular edge to the work. All right, so 
The front is now gathered and stitched in place and you can see that we have this nice section of tight gathers at the very side going into slightly softer gathers towards center, going into a flat section at center, and then softer gathers again, moving into deep gathers at the side. So the whole front has been stitched now. And the next thing that we'll do is we'll pull the binding slash waistband up, and then we'll fold it over, and then we'll just hem it in place. And when we hem it in place, we're just going to encase the seam allowance and we'll stitch the band to the back of the pleats. We're not necessarily trying to stitch directly on the stitches that, that connect the gathers to the band. We're just trying to cover this, but with the fold being stitched onto the backs of the gathers, what ends up happening is there's actually a little bit of control that happens. The the binding itself stabilizes the back of the pleats, giving them just a little bit more oomph coming off of the body. This uh, stitching the folded edge of this piece of bias in place. And I just stabbed myself. Super exciting. Very awake now. It's really dry in here, so the static is pretty insane on this thread. I don't really like using static guards and things because um, sometimes they have Teflon in them and I don't want to put that stuff in the air that I'm breathing. Okay. I'm also making sure as I work that my bias tape doesn't become twisted because then I'll end up with very unsightly wrinkles on the outside. And you'll see as I'm working, when I'm trying to make sure that the bias is in alignment, you'll see me put, twist the binding around itself so that this is kind of fanning out this way and that also will help control the way it drapes off of the waist because we're using a binding style finish and not a waistband the instead of being flat against the body and the pleats coming out you'll have the binding right along the top of the gathers and it'll sit very perpendicular to the body, and that's what we want. So if we're kind of fanning these pleats out as we secure the binding in place, we're also adding to the tendency for the skirt to hang nicely from the body. So as this is wrapping around the seam allowance, it needs to be quite tight, and I find this to be pretty tiring to my hands. So keep that in mind, that this might be a little difficult for your hands and that you should make sure to take regular breaks so that you can uh, not damage your hands at all. I think it's really important to always remember that, you know, as much as I like working six to eight hours at a stretch, it's not always good for your hands if you're doing something that requires this level of pressure and tension and manipulation to the layers of fabric. And what you'll see me do here is I'll reach the end of this right here, and I'm gonna take a couple of stitches in one place just for extra security. One. Ooh, this is thick. Two. And now, I can just move right into making the tie. So I just fold this into thirds, which is how it naturally wants to sit. And then I finish it out with a pick stitch. But this pick stitch is done, this is not done as a running stitch, this is done as a, a spaced 
pick of a back stitch and I'm going through to the other side just a little bit so that I can create uh, so that I'm certain that I'm getting through all of the layers and by doing it with a back stitch style motion what I'm doing is ensuring that it has some stretch and flexibility in it a back stitch is a remarkably flexible stitch but a running stitch is essentially a straight line of thread so with the back stitch for sure you're actually getting some some flex